lives. And uh, I am just so excited to go. <laughs> Am I strangling you? <laughs> for you guys get to just say what you think so <laughs> so just let those opinions fly um, and nobody knows what is going to be asked um, so uh, before we get started even though I'm sure you you all know um, everybody here let me just uh, quickly say I'm Kid O'Toole I'm one of the co-hosts of uh, Talk More Talk I'm the author of Songs We're Singing Guided Tours of the Beatles Lesser Known Tracks as you know, this gentleman, he's uh, you know, authored so many books that uh, I think we will be here all night <laughs> if I said them all. Uh, but, uh, but among them, two-volume biography of George Martin, and of course, as we all know, the upcoming biography of Mal Evans, Ken Womack. Thank <laughs> Next, he is the authority on the Beatles in Canada and uh, all of their releases, their memorabilia, their history, and of course John, uh, John Lennon's connections with Canada, John and Yoko's. He is the man you want to see. He's written two volumes on it. Uh, the Blue and Red, uh, Books in the Blue Book is coming out. But is it the Blue or the Red? The Red, the Red is out and gone. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, here's how it okay. Next, another expert. If you want to know about the Beatles, the North American tours, this is the guy you want to talk to. He wrote an incredible two volume set uh, called Some Fun Tonight, and uh, I'm not going to read the entire title. <laughs> Take the whole podcast. Yeah, so we take the whole podcast. No, but it's it's really it is the authority, and he has a memorabilia collection that he loans out to various museums. And in fact, the uh, collection is right here in Illinois right now at Ravinia uh, Festival. Yeah, so uh, so if you live here and you are going to Ravinia, check it out. So um, just a pleasure to have him here, Chuck Gunderson. And last but definitely not least. Um, he is uh, just, I mean, everyone knows him here at the fest. He's been here since the first fest, right? Yeah, and he was there when Mark Lugidos even came up with the idea. And uh, he's the executive editor of the Open Magazine and the author of uh, Change of Times, 101 Days That Changed a Generation. And uh, also, again, a pleasure to have him here, Al Sussman. <laughs> All right, so uh, let the games begin. Um, so, and I'll stop strangling Ken now, so let's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> talk more about the true crime podcast. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that would be good. Exactly. So, I have some questions, um, that my co-host sent, and also, uh, what a couple that viewers sent, um, and I know you guys have some questions that, uh, that you said you, you have as well. So, all right, let's start with, and then we'll just pass the mic down here. And uh, we'll start with Ken Michaels um, ask some questions. What do you think is the most underrated solo Beatles album? Thank you, Ken. Wow, this is, so I, I should rack my brain. Rack your brain. Right now. Right now. All right. The most under 
underrated solo Beatles album? That is a tough call. Um, I'm going to go with a fan favorite, so I know that I'm not the only one who believes this, but we'll never believe it's received the accolades it should. And uh, even from its even from its maker, Paul McCartney, uh, the 1979 Beatles album back in the day. I just racked my brains. I feel the tremors. And it's not just a polka man. A, a, a person, a polka, a good man, a friend of ours has it right now. Lovely. Is that the sunny side or over the... <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, I, I remember getting that the day it came out uh, and listening to it on KLOL. K -L -O -L and you, you know that song. They played it at midnight. A day early, they got trouble. Um, but I, I remember loving it from the word go. Just liked it. And uh, the reason why I selected it is because, uh, because I believe we should have reason. It's not just a thing that's hard. Um, the reason why I selected it is it had such an edgy sound that Paul adopted for it. Um, and I know, because we know Chris Thomas, uh, and what Chris Thomas went through producing that album uh, with Paul's ever changing perspective. Uh, on that record, um, he really won out and ensured that it had kind of a nice hard rocking edge to it. I just love that record, and uh, I feel like what it top out at seven or nine on the United States uh, charts. I've always felt like perhaps that felt like a message to Paul to maybe take a turn, and I guess that turn was McCartney too, uh, perhaps. But uh, I wish he'd stayed in that vein just a little bit longer. So we get to have more live work from, uh, from the great Lawrence Jewel. So there you go. The, the key word uh, was underrated. So underrated by me. Yeah, I'll, I'll describe for that. Underrated by me. Some, an album I've been listening to the last couple of years. an album by uh, uh, I was to the Wonderwall by George Harris. And uh, I, I found that he can listen to it. Or whatever I do, it's a very interesting record. Um, it kind of takes off where it stops. Can't be solved. Uh, that's my vote, and uh, I'm sticking with it. Now on there, 
uh, really helped, especially vocally. Um, some of the backup vocals from um, uh, people like Mickey Brown, and etc. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, unfortunately, George did absolutely no promotion for it. And the label did, Warner Brothers, did virtually no promotion for it because it was the last album in George's uh, contract with, uh, with Warner's. But uh, other, than, other than that, it's a fine album. Uh, I would say that's a, you know, a, a, an un, um, an under, definitely an underrated album. See, I told you this was going to be a great panel. <laughs> All excellent, uh, excellent answers. Um, we have another question, uh, this time from our buddy Joe Mayo. Um, and uh, I think Chuck is going to particularly like this question. What Beatles song would you have loved to have seen them perform live um, between 1960 and 1966? Um, so, Chuck, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Incredibly hard question. <laughs> First of all, I love the feedback speakers. I wish the Beatles had those. Yeah. <laughs> so easy, right? You can hear yourself and all that. Okay, the song I'd love for them to have in their set list. <laughs> it's a tie. I can have a tie, right? Al did a tie. Okay, and they're really kind of really deep dive songs. I love to see them performed. Okay, first one, Hippie Hippie Shake. Second one, Clarabella. Not their songs, but I would have loved to see them on stage doing that. Oh, excellent. All right. Anyone else? Jump in. Oh, uh, I thought this was for Chuck. Oh, no, it's for everybody. I'm oh, it's for starting. everybody. Uh, actually, uh, for much the same reason. I would pick a shot of rhythm and blues. I'm on a, I'm a, I'm a BBC freak. In fact, uh, our, our friend Tom Frangione, the last, uh, I guess, three weeks, has been playing a lot of the BBC material from the, the Pop Go the Beatles uh, summer series that he did for the BBC in the summer of 63. And I just love that stuff. And a shot of rhythm and blues, which was which was a really kind of like a, a, a beat group standard in Liverpool in those in the early 60s. And uh, yeah, I would have loved to have seen them do that in concert. Okay, you said 1960 to 66? 60 to 66. Okay, um, well, um, I would probably pick something from Help, um, 1965. Maybe something that they couldn't really play to a noisy crowd, but uh, I would pick uh, probably uh, You've Got the Hundred Love Away or, or uh, The Night Before. Those are the two off, off the Canadian slash American album, not the British album. And I'm going to go to an easy one. Um, but I, I think it would have a sentimental connection with folks, and that's uh, in my life. I think, you know, it, it's such a staple of weddings and so many other kinds of celebrations now. Uh, and to be able to play that would have, uh, would have made sense for its author uh, to have an opportunity uh, to give a shot with that one. So, easy, but there it is. So this would be part of the acoustic part of the set, right? It, yeah. Sure, although it, you know, it worked fine with electric. They could bang that out. The solo would be lacking. They played yesterday long, so you know. Yeah. 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 For the record, I guess I'll uh, go with uh, some other guy. Yeah, yeah. some other guy. Yeah. Oh, I would love to hear that. I mean, that just would have brought down the house. I just, you know, whenever I've seen the footage of them, you know, I put just that little bit doing them doing it in the camera. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, okay, this is from a uh, viewer um, 
of, uh, of ours and also one of my students in my mind classes. Um, and uh, let's see, he brought up, he submitted a bunch of them. <laughs> I'm picking the one that, uh, that I think would uh, be the best for you guys. Um, okay, how about, what is your favorite solo music video for each Beatle? Um, you know, just, uh, you know, any of them, um, and, uh, and he specifically says, do not include feature films. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to pick for each one. You could pick, you know, one or two if that's, if that's, uh, more doable. Well, being a sentimentalist. I'm going to pick one that may seem out of left field for folks, but I, it was a sappy song that I loved. Uh, and I, I remember the, the beautiful soft focus video. It was so bad. Oh, I love that damn song, and I stand by it. Um, that's where I'm going. Pierce? Um, was that, did I choose yours? No. no. <laughs> Just to go back to the question, is it solo or Beatles? Uh, solo. What about three Does that count? Yeah, so, well, sure. Okay. I would go with three as a bird because okay. I think that is a tremendous for its time. The stuff they did in that video, just still when I watch it, it's just how did they do all that? I don't know, but that's my opinion. I'd say for me it's pretty easy. It would be Paul McCartney's coming up. Uh, He's doing all the things for that. And then he'd be Uh, I thought we were gonna. I uh, thought it was gonna be all four. Yeah, I mean, it's however many you feel comfortable with. Sure, okay. You do all four. You're okay. not a suspect. You get all four. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Age over uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, all right, then I'll I'll go with all four. Um, for John, I would go with um, with the original video for whatever gets you through the night. Much of which was um, was filmed in Central Park. In fact, around the uh, ironically, the Central Park band shell. Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, it was uh, I guess redone, right, for, by by Yogo for um, uh, the Lennon Legend yeah, mind games. Um, archive. Um, Okay, for George, um, easy. Uh, Cracker Box Palace. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, for Paul, I would, you know, I'll actually go with uh, uh, with Chuck's uh, pick coming up. And for Ringo, here's another wild card. Uh, in from 1976, a lot of people probably haven't even, probably never seen this. And it's the video for You Don't Know Me At All. I've seen that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, from the, uh, from the Road Reviewer album, uh, which was during that period of, after Ringo had shaved his head. And I can remember um, when John got his green card, and he kept saying to you know, the media, saying, why did Ringo shave his head? <laughs> but, it was, but it was a really, a really nice video. Too bad that it never really saw much in the way of circulation. So that's, those are my things. Okay, we're running short on time. I'll just add one other, but I have to echo Al's um, Cracker Buck Palace. Yeah, yeah. You know, the ending scene of the bed. For a team you <laughs> Anyways, um, that's mine. like choreography. Um, I'll, I'll add one in there. Um, I've always liked the uh, video for um, uh, for Paul for press. I always thought that was fun. Yeah, um, with him on the, on the tube and interacting with people and it was just, you know, kind of a side of Paul. He, up until then you didn't see much with him interacting with fans. I, I always liked that. And, uh, and also George's ballway video because it's just so yeah. silly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just fun seeing him. I mean, the the bad, you know, bad effects 
that I mean, for now particularly, but that kind of made it, you know, that was half the fun. Um, so I, I enjoyed those as well. Uh, here's another question from Ken Michaels. I think uh, uh, all of you will definitely have opinions on this. Which of the archival box sets of the Beatles has impressed you the most and why? Uh, uh, just Beatles. Just Beatles. So the archival box sets for me, hands down, is uh, the White Album. Um, it has, uh, I learned more from the nooks and crannies of that one than any of the others. Uh, I think it needed the remixing more than any of the others. You know, Giles and his team, their ability to create separation in the tracks really opened up the instruments and I was able to hear tonality better, not in some cases actual instruments I hadn't really uh, spent time with. So it, without a doubt, it's it's the White Album. Um, in terms of comedy, I have to pick Abbey Road, which has uh, the Abbey Road <laughs> on the first page. It's really important to have editors. I mean, I've learned this in difficult ways over and over again, but the Beatles should have not have a happy So it's the White Album for me. Here's Well, I won't pick the White Album, but I'll go with Sgt. Pepper Box set. And uh, I think what what blew me away was, was when they did the release and, and we were allowed to listen to it on the Dolby Atmos in the theater. And they blackened, turned off all the lights, I've never heard anything like that before. So, and I, I could not possibly afford a uh, Dolby Atmos system for my house, so yeah, it was a one off. I think for me, it's probably un unpopular, it would be the re release of the Capitol American Records. For me, yeah, it was total nice. nostalgia. Um, when I got those, again, it just reminded me of being a kid and riding my bike down to the record store and getting the early Beatles or Beatles 6. And um, that, that was it for me. The Blue Box or Volume 1 and Volume 2? Both. Uh. <laughs> for me, I, I think I'll go with, uh, with Ken's choice of, uh, of the White Album box. Uh, for, me, for one thing, just to get a really professional recording of the Easter demos is was almost worth the price of admission. But also it's like certain tracks on the remix, like for instance Dear Prudence, which is a song I've always liked, but the the remix just made it uh, you know a, a new listening experience. It was it's just wonderful. And so many of the other tracks on there are are, are definitely worth it. So I'll go with the white album. <laughs> All right. Um, and for the record, I, I love the Sgt. Pepper uh, box set. I just love the sound on that, as Pierce said. Um, it just brought the hell in the light for me. Um, All right. Now, I know that uh, uh, you guys brought some questions of your own. So I'm going to um, turn it to you guys. And I'm dying to hear. Uh, what uh, what questions you brought? So, um, uh, Piers, I know you uh, you had some uh, questions prepared. So, uh, so why don't you start uh, with one of yours? I have two, and I'm trying to think which would be the better one. I would say that uh, my question would be um, when the Beatles stopped touring in, in uh, 1966. There was this sort of window of three, four, five months where, uh, you know, their manager, uh, Brian Epstein, was, was saying, you know, they haven't broken up, they're doing other things, but the press thought otherwise. And uh, there was always something to say that the Beatles had broken up, they wouldn't be getting back together. And, and really my question is, uh, you know, what if you know, that was true? And, and, you know, they hadn't, you know, John hadn't come up with strawberry fields or all that, you know, and you know, um, you know, the monkey saw it as, as a uh, golden opportunity or the management saw it as an opportunity because the 
Felix had nothing at the end of 66. The door was wide open for another group to come in. And uh, they were kind of hanging on by a thread as far as I remember. You know, just read that they were done. So that's kind of my question is, is the what if. I find that an inspiring question. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, what if? Uh, I think that it would change, of course, their legacy and their level of achievement considerably. Um, you know, the masterworks, beginning with Revolver, obviously, which would have been out in that, that question, but the, the further records later really cement their legacy for all time. So we would be discussing them different. I don't think there would be a Beatles fest, quite frankly, uh, based upon the material. Um, as wonderful as it is, we all know this, but we all know the Beatles is a settled question, right? Um, so uh, that, that's my, my thinking on that. But uh, just as interesting, I love that moment because that interregnum is what creates a kind of mystique, right? And when they finally show up again in, uh, en masse in the press, say around Brian's launch party in May 1967, they don't even look the same, right? And so it's as though they disappeared in the chocolate, into the chocolate factory, right? And my students love this metaphor, by the way. And they've emerged, and now you have the everlasting gobstopper. Damn it, where was this? It's wonderful, right? So the, it, it was the beginning of a creation of a kind of mystique that they alone have enjoyed among rock's heavyweights. And then, of course, to walk off the stage forever in August 1969, it, uh, also helps to sustain that mystique. I think that's such an important part of who they become, and they're starting to do it right there during that period you identify. Yeah, that's tough, and Kenny stole a little bit of my thunder because I think we're well, here. I did that. I now, you always did. <laughs> Anyways, um, I think we're here at the 44th Fest in Chicago, is that correct? Okay. So maybe we would have had 18 fests and the Lupitos family might have called it quits because there wasn't anything post-66 that he could have gone off of. But uh, an interesting question because, um, you know, uh, they were well off, I would say, financially. Um, they could have gone in all kind of different directions at that point, um, walking off that stage at Candlestick Park and finding themselves kind of not these performing more known for performing on stage and um it's it's i just think that they would have um absolutely gone in different directions paul might have gone more into the theatrical world uh, broadway um, songwriting for other artists that type of thing um, Ringo might have just disappeared into the interland with Maureen with hairdressing. I don't know. Um, George might have, he was there already with his uh, self-realization, who he is, who he was, why he was. He was sick of being a Beatle. So we kind of know where George would have went. It's kind of in a self-realization, find myself path, and I've got a lot of money to do it and take the time to do it. John's kind of a crapshoot. Who knows what John would have done? Because he was so into a lot of things. Um, so maybe John might have went more into the art um, kind of thing with his, he was such a great artist to begin with. And he, I think he kind of wanted, went in a career with that, but still dabbling in the music business. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, because Yoko was not in the, um in the in the, the in, in the involved yet, um, yeah, I, and also, frankly, at that point in his uh, in you know in his development, he was definitely in uh, in his in his drug period. So you know who knows? Um, but Paul absolutely, Paul would have continu continued as either a performer or just a you know a mainstream songwriter. No question. With George, you know, the day the day after Candlestick Park on the on the plane, he said, "That's it. I'm not a Beatle anymore." But at that point, he really didn't have, a, you know, much of a backlog of uh, of songs. So it's kind of tough. You know, certainly there was no, nothing like all things must pass would have been, 
look, you know, on the horizon right away in, in early 67. So who knows? And Ringo, Ringo might have, uh, you know, cause he, he was, even then, was doing uh, occasional sessions. So he might have, you know, especially considering how much of a session drummer he became later on, uh, he might have uh, started a little bit earlier. Um, so it's, you know, it, it is really kind of an imponderable, but also, yeah, I mean, Revolver would have been, I guess, the, you know, kind of the Abbey Road moment. In there, in the swan song, yeah, exactly. And what but, a fitting song to end. And what we never know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very true. You know, I mean, but their, I think their place in history would be would be pretty much would be secure. But as Chuck mentioned, you know, the masterworks were still were still ahead of them. Chuck up. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's such a great question. You know, without those master works, by the way, what does that do to the studio album era, right? The era of the great recording artists, Pink Floyd, you know, you just go on and on. Suddenly, uh, suddenly we don't have that, uh, that moment created, which is so very important to rock becoming a studio art and not dependent upon, uh, upon live performance. Uh, and I think our lives certainly wouldn't have been obviously as good because we'd be missing a very significant chunk of music. But having said that, there is an argument that their lives would have been better. Uh, maybe in almost every case. Wow, well, that is a good point, Ken, because yeah, I mean, Sgt. Pepper was, you know, an album that elevated rock to an art. and. Uh, uh, definitely, you know, set the standard for, the, you know, the album as an artistic statement. So, yeah, I mean, what would have, what would have happened? Yeah, that is a very good question, Piers. That was, you know, definitely, a, a, that's a, astounding to think that, you know, after 66, that what would have happened? I mean, that uh, the Beatles could have just ended. So, uh, as you said, we might not be here over 40 years later. I mean, that's, that is really a thought-provoking question. Um, how about uh, if anyone else have any questions they want to uh, want to share? Uh, Chuck, do you have any? I'll go, great. Okay, here we go again. <laughs> oh, come on, you know what I'm gonna ask the panel is, if you could have seen the Beatles live anywhere, <laughs> where would that have been? For me, easy. Star Club, 1962, in the suits, Ringo on drums, fresh into the residency. Not at the end, fresh, when they're kind of, hey, this is it. I mean, they kind of retired in Hamburg by that time, but still, I think it would have been great. Al? Um, matter of fact, we talked about this last night at the, uh, um, uh, the panel, and um, I would say, and I brought this up last night, I would go with their final performance at the Cavern on August 3rd, 1963, which unfortunately was never recorded, but still, it's fun to deal with fantasy, uh, because uh, especially at that point, they had had two number one singles, they had a number one album, they were just about to release the record that would launch them into superstar, and they were absolutely at the top of their game as performers, the, all those those BBC recordings I keep talking about uh, show that. Um, so I would go with uh, yeah with the, their performance, their final performance of the camera. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, tough question, but <clears throat> I would go with uh, June of 1963, uh, a place called the City Center in Salisbury. I was at school with uh, my two brothers. Yeah, um, and, and of course, uh, I was probably too young to go, but my parents told my older brother he couldn't go because it was a school night. I thought, that doesn't really help nowadays, but that was what it was like. You know, you had school and that was it. But they did play, and uh, they played everything up to, I guess, from me to you. So that was their latest record. and. 
I'd seen them on television, but uh, would it be nice to see them live? Okay. I'd be fairly early too, and it'd be October 1963 at the Palladium, right? So we could we we spend so much time for good reason on the onset of American Beatlemania, and I would like to I'd like to know more about that. You know, we have anecdotes and accounts, but uh, as all of these comments suggest, it sure would have been wonderful, right, to be able to feel that energy, especially afterwards, right? I, uh, for the same reason, I would want to be at the Cow Palace in 1965, where that energy goes dark. Would you throw a chair? I would not throw a chair, but uh, as we know, others did. And uh, I mean, it was like a war zone afterwards with Mao and others, you know, helping the wounded. Um, and uh, so historically, I'm interested in both of those because they show a, an interesting turn. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would uh, have to go, you know, like, probably go with Al because I've always wanted to see a cavern show. I mean, come on, you got it. I mean, the Star Club is a close second. I mean, that is a very close second. But uh, but yeah, I would have loved that. And but uh, but yeah, a later cavern uh, show, and, and probably as uh, Al mentioned, one of their last ones. Nobody mentioned the one where nobody showed up. Yeah. Yeah, now that would be, yeah, yeah, now that would have been, yeah, I mean, just basically, you know, I almost said Shea Stadium, but I'm like, well, but you couldn't hear them, I mean, it would be interesting to be there historically, but I want to be able to hear them, you know, and also I heard it was extremely humid, and, you know, I don't do humid, but anyway, <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, Ken, uh, you said you have a question. Sure, and I, I can even kick out a a first stab at an answer, although I'm sure everybody else's will be better, but, uh, you know, picking up off the idea of which performance would you go to, which which day in the studio would you have liked to have attended? Um, I, for me, it's uh, it's the day they record the guitar solos for the end. You know, because that's one nutty day, that's the same day a certain biscuit was stolen out of somebody's <laughs> guitar cabinet uh, by a certain yeah, wife of, an, of another band member, and uh, so there was a lot of tension, but then of course they create those great solos. I would love, and, and the Abbey Road box set fails to do this for us, I would love to have heard how those solos were originally created. Um, they, according, Alan Parsons has told me they are not like you hear them, uh, that he created the connective tissue between each one, not the musical tissue, but made it so by his editing, one would kick off the next solo. Um, and, uh, and he wasn't even sure what order they were in, but he found he liked that one. So I would love to have uh, been at that studio so we could write some of that down uh, and get that down correctly. But I, I pass it on to you for your ideas about studio sessions you would attend as a fly on the wall. So I have to think <laughs> more than the concerts. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to cheat and take the easy way out of it. You know my name, look up the name. Oh, <laughs> I, I got a tie, and they're total opposites. <laughs> the first one is where they go in and do a whole album in one day. <laughs> okay, so you see it all. The second one would have been so funny to be there is Tomorrow Never Knows, because George Martin and Brian Epstein just looked at each other and go, what? <laughs> what is this? It's like one chord. Uh, you know? And they're just thinking, okay, I guess the Beatles have to do anything they want. So, and obviously it was a great song. Yeah. I would go with uh, a session, unfortunately, I'm forgetting the date and one of the songs. Uh, this is what happens when you get to my age. Um, and this is in March of, of 65 during the sessions for help. But it was the day that, uh, that Paul recorded in the same session. I'm down. I'm down. Yesterday. And what was the third I've one? Seen the face. Yes. yes. Yeah. Wow. Which stylistically are you know all over the place. But it would wow. be fascinating. It would be fascinating to see the session for that for those three songs. Surely you have one. 
Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to have been there for a uh, day in the life when they uh, first were recording the orchestra and, and just being there for the, you know, the crazy atmosphere, the, the people who were there, the guests. And it uh, would have been interesting even uh, to see them trying to figure out what to do at the end when they eventually, of course, decided on the ever long piano chord. But to be there, to see them doing that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I know this is really stupid. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, just to be there for such a historic moment, I, I mean, that, that would be, uh, that'd be pretty interesting. But, I mean, there's so many. But yeah, the end, guitar, you know, trio would be pretty, uh, pretty cool to see too. That's a close second. Um, Can I say one more? Oh, sure. How many of you would like to be at the DECA audition? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. walking with the nerves, the, you know, banter, the, them looking at them. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> Um, so that would have been a fly on the wall at the deck auditions. What was the three words? Sugar Plum Fairy. Yeah. 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 Deck is such a great choice because um, they're never going to get that deal. It was never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Regional prejudice was never going to let that happen. Mike Smith was a gigantic liar saying, oh, you guys should record. That's not a com that's not commitment. That's just like you guys should continue breathing oxygen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, what if that? Because of course they must have had exuberance uh, in in so many ways. You know, Paul would later. That's why John would later downplay their performance. It didn't matter what they did. That's great. All right, uh, Al. Do you have uh, have a question? Yeah, I do. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, this is actually something that we were talking about yesterday at lunch. This the is best. well, the sun. What matters? And actually, Chuck brought it up. Um, and correct me if I'm wording this wrong. If if we could name one song from I think you said the bottom of the deck. You know, not one of the absolute favorites. The, your top five. What, right. What would, what would be one, next? One of the five you would take out and put a deeper dive song. Okay. All righty. Uh, and the one I chose was not a second time. Yeah. Because I mean, people. You know, whenever you know, I, 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 I do an interview or something, and I give my top five songs. They all tend to be kind of later songs. And then I, you know, I get past it, and I think, oh, you know, why didn't I, why didn't I say, and all these, those early, those fabulous early John Lennon songs, you know, uh, if I fell, uh, yes, it is, mm -hmm. uh, and and not a second time, yes. you know, the the, the song that uh, uh, William Mann, right, the, uh, uh, the Sunday Times uh, critic. Uh, raved about the Aeolian cadences, <laughs> even though John was trying to write a song that sounded like Smokey Robinson. Uh, but it's a wonderful song, and if you've ever heard, not only I mean, the, the Beatles recording alone, except for a few technical little problems, um, you know, John's vocal yeah. is just wonderful. There's also a, a later version by Robert Holland, which is wonderful. So I think that would be my, my choice. So as it goes in the Beatles world, I've already changed since lunchtime. I've got another one. I threw that one out. So I have my top five songs. I'm going to throw one of those five and put a deeper dive song. And the one I'm putting in as I sit here now, almost 12 hours later, would be Leave My Kitten Alone. Oh, wow. Okay, so are these songs that we think are lesser songs? Is that? Well, I, I pick a couple of songs off the album Something New. I think something new has some substandard people stuff on it. Um, tell me why. I don't. I don't. Never thought that was such a great song. Maybe somebody would disagree with me, but it seems like it was written pretty quickly. Um, and what are some of the other songs on something new? After the 
Okay. I'm not getting help from him. When I get home, there's another example. These are just, I mean, I remember having that album thinking, no, there's a couple of good songs. There's a, a German version of I Want to Hold Your Hand. Any time at all was fun. Any time at all was yeah. great. But it's not a record I go back to. Anyway, that's my. <laughs> Do you know it's one move? Yeah. Uh, it's I'll Be Back. You're getting better. Yeah, it's, it's I'll Be Back. I, uh, yeah, that song uh, changed me. It was um, when, when we were getting that fusillade of compilations in the 1970s, and I got love songs, you know, and I bought it because that's what you do, right? <laughs> so I bought the thing with its, uh, it had that, it looked like the kind of things we would do in history class. You would take a, a piece of paper and put it in the yeah. oven so it sort of tarnish and be a little brown or black around the edges. And, that's, and it looked like that kind of design. And I, I just thought, what am I doing? I'm just spending my allowance on this again, right? I'm just, I'm in the machine already. But that came on and I thought, you know, I can hear, I can still hear that moment when the, the ringing guitar kicks in and it's such a big moment for them, right? First of all, it ends the album not with a pot bowl boiler like George Martin believed they should, but almost with, with a kind of downbeat nostalgia. Um, just beautiful stuff. I remember that vividly. I think it's a perfect annual for the album. Oh, me too. Mm -hmm. But it just, uh, it's, it's, it's also a, a, such a beautiful song. It is beautiful, Carmen. Yeah. For me, it's a, a sort of leap in songwriting maturity. The rest of the album doesn't sound like that. And, and by the way, bounce. an album all, that's a, such a good point, SRR, because it's an album of a lot of great new original material, exactly. and then, boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very like nice. It was the giant step. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Tan, you stole mine. Um. <laughs> I thought you were leaving my kids alone. Yeah, no. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'll be back is is one of my uh, my favorite deep cuts too. I just think it's a beautiful song and, and uh, absolutely. Um, Yours is Mr. Moonlight. Well, yeah, okay. See, Ken Ken gets me about this. I will defend Mr. Moonlight in some ways because okay. I think that opening, you know, yell yeah, that you know. I would delete it. <laughs> yeah, you know. The organ, the organ was a big mistake. That, that really, if they hadn't added that organ, that, you know, I don't know what they were thinking, that was really cheesy. I mean, I don't know. vocal. But the vocal, Fair enough. you know, the vocal is great, and yeah. that opening, yeah. you know, when you first hear it, you know, when you hear that opening, you're like, this is going to be great, and then the organ comes in. Yeah. <laughs> Think about how elevated Beatles for Sale would be. With leave my kid alone. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know. I know. Although maybe cheap Mr. Moonlight, because vocalism is amazing. Yeah. Even though I believe it. Uh, <laughs> and toss out the last song and put uh, leave my kid alone there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe. And nobody should mess with my kid. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Oh man! All right, I've got one question of my own, and then we'll uh, throw it out to um, yeah, throw it out to uh, the audience. Um, so uh, this was asked the last time uh, we did rack our brains, and I uh, thought I'd uh, borrow this and and take it live and ask you guys: What do you think is the biggest mistake that the Beatles made? In, in their careers, uh, I mean, as a, as a group, what do you think in their story was the biggest mistake um, that they made? I need a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We start not getting the right songs on something new. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, my, my take on it is that uh, they, they, uh, they did tour you know, and then chunks, you know, 64, 65, 66. But their biggest mistake was that they didn't really refresh their set list. You know, they kept doing, up and until 66, Twist and Shout, and, uh, you know, I didn't get to go to any of those shows. It probably didn't matter. But, you know, when they try and do Paperback Writer, if I needed someone, uh, they mix it up with, with stuff that's kind of old, and it, I just felt that, their biggest mistake was that they, they, 
I mean, it just seems dated or tired or what, but uh, fans who've seen them in 64, 65, by 66, it's like, well, we saw this last year. So it was, you know, maybe it just didn't seem fresh. That's my uh, I don't think they made really any mistakes. It's one of those things that just did really well. But if I had to say one mistake, they quit touring a couple of years. Then they follow Elvis's lead and they do a comeback special in the black leathers. Ooh. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> That would be important. I'm going to cheat a little bit because actually um, we had a discussion, the same discussion on things we said today back when I was uh, when I was involved there, uh, and I think it probably is the biggest mistake I think they made was thinking that they could go on as business people in the wake of Brian Epstein's death. If they had brought somebody in, not Alan Klein, but there were other people who probably could have done a, you know, a better job, a more, certainly a more honest job, of guiding them business-wise than, um, than, than Klein. But even, you know, for the, the couple of years between Brian's death and when Klein came in, they were, you know, they were trying to basically lead themselves and with the formation of Apple and everything, and it just um, it just didn't work. So I think that's probably their biggest mistake. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, and Apple, of course, drains so much of their capital and puts them in perilous positions, which cause friction inside their relationships. Magical Mystery Tour, the television movies, an obvious example. I mean, all the energy they put into that. Um, but I'm, I'm going to throw one at a, uh, at a central party, and that's George Martin. I think he makes a big mistake, ego-wise, uh, by taking three weeks off during the White Album. It was a terrible error. Um, I don't know that it harmed the music that dramatically. Chris Thomas was doing his bidding anyway, but the fact that he had this ego moment misses the David Frost uh, shoot, um, where the ideation occurs for the Get Back project afterwards, and these are terrible miscalculations by George, and in the words of our friend Mark Lewison, they froze him out for a while. He shows up uh, at Get Back, we can see him all over the film, because he's invoicing them. And he's got to get paid, he's out on his own now. But uh, they're not calling him up and saying, George, get out here to the studio. You know, we, we need you at Twickenham. Now, he rises to the occasion, obviously, uh, when they get to Apple Studio at various debacles, Magic Alex, etc. But uh, I think that was a really crucial error that caused them to make a few mistakes in their story and uh, kind of derails them a little bit. Um, I'm not sure about all the implications, but I, I, I feel strongly about that. What's your well, my, my first one would be exactly what Al said about, you know, there's a difference between being, you know, creative person and a business person, and you can't really do both. Um, the second one I'd say is Magical Mystery Tour. Um, I mean, the, the soundtrack album was wonderful, but, uh, you know, the film, <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, Paul maybe learned, I hope, well, maybe you didn't with, but, with um, Broad Street. <laughs> you don't uh, write a script with by uh, doing a pie chart, you know? Uh, you, you've got to actually have a script. Yeah, yeah. Did, did he even use the pie chart for Broad Street? What did he use for that? Yeah. Like, uh, eh, he had an idea. Yeah. Good <laughs> <laughs> idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because that was that was ill conceived, and you know now if they had done maybe one with just the, the music videos, I mean the music videos were okay, trying to tell the story. but wow, the rest of it not so good. So um, we have time for like maybe like one one or two questions. So uh, yeah.
I was just thinking the field of dreams in Iowa. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that'd be interesting. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great yeah, question. that's a great venue. I, I would have liked to have seen them, I guess, picking up on what Chuck was saying, you know, at Madison Square Garden when it yeah, opened, yeah, you know, yeah. all the soot and <laughs> grotesquery aside, you know, to have big time uh, state of the art sound opportunities and to be able to perform their songs, all of their songs with, with some kind of a plum would have been, would have been interesting. And I'm from Canada, so I'm going to go with Montreal, uh, Expo 67, and they, they were, the Beatles were asked to, to play at Expo 67, of course they didn't, but other groups did, so the Grateful Dead, uh, Jefferson Airplane, Supremes, all the big names, but the Beatles didn't, uh, but Jerry Park, yeah. so I, w I would pick Expo 67, and uh, the summer of love. I guess we heard a little bit about it in the Get Back film, but uh, something about the QE2. Um, how about them being the house band on the QE2 for a week and you're sailing across the Atlantic? Dance all songs. Yes. They got to play it all, though. Yeah, dance offs at night, you know, going back to cavern sets. Yeah, we got to get the Apple Jacks. Yes. Stonehenge. Stonehenge would be good. <laughs> Pyramids of Giza. Yeah. How about this? The Stones played Madison Square Garden in late November, around Thanksgiving of 1969, on their, their first tour uh, in America since early 67. How about if the Beatles had said, you know what, we can top that. I mean, they've been following us for five years. <laughs> we can top that and say, on New Year's Eve, 1969, the Beatles had appeared at Madison Square Garden, maybe taking Chuck's cue in, in black leather. <laughs> they did have a pretty good catalog by then. That, yeah, that's right. yeah. In fact, they had all of it. <laughs> yes. Okay, we'll take one more question and then we're going to have to end it. So, Tony? I would buy it. <laughs> I would love to see it. I, I love that. Uh, I lie around, right? All those. From every decade. Every, yeah, those yeah. are just such great songs, and some of them deserve just as much mention as their A side. I, I'm all over that. Yeah. But like, I lie around, the mess, all of those yeah. great tunes. You bet. Maybe not Rudolph the Red Nose Ring. <laughs> I would pass on that one. But otherwise, I'm right in. Okay, so is your question just the B sides? I'm sorry, the A sides. Both, oh, like the past yeah. master. I call oh, them like yeah, yeah, absolutely. And why, why has it been done? I know, right? Are you working for Paul right now? And you're ready to like <laughs> suss, <laughs> yeah. suss this out? Yeah, I totally do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I believe he owns uh, all of his own masters. And uh, if you remember, getting back to Alan Klein and the Stones, um, I guess it was in the early 90s, uh, Avco released a complete Rolling Stones singles collection um, of all of their A-sides and B-sides from the years for, for which Klein controlled the masters, so all the 60s and her and very early 70s. So basically now, unfortunately, since it's, you know, we're dealing with 52 years worth of material, it would be a pretty large set, but yeah, a set of, you know, the complete, the complete Paul McCartney A-sides and B-sides, yeah. Maybe with a more original title. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful panel. Thank you for some great, great questions. Um, thank you so much.